On this week in sales, we're going to be taking a look at whether B2B sales is heading into a self-service era, what super productive people do differently, why 2020 wasn't bad for all sales professionals, and much, much more. My name is Will Barron. I'm one half of this week in sales. The other half, the legend that is Victor Antonio, joins me by the power of Skype. Victor, how's it going, sir? Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, Will. How are you doing, man? I am very well. I'm excited to chat with you. I feel like it's only been, it's been two weeks that we, since we recorded last. It feels like it's been much, much longer than that. I think three, actually, if you take it from, it's got to be, I think, three, well, anyway, a long time. It's been at least two weeks. <laughs> it's been at least two. It's been a long time, Well, It's been a long time. So let's let's kind of get the rust off ourselves and, you know, do our thing. So how was your time off, by the way? Well, I didn't have any time off. The oh, I, I, I've, I've been holding back on saying this, and I don't feel like I want to fully announce it yet, but we may say have... It. Just well, say it. I, until until it arrives, Victor, I don't want to jinx anything because there's things that could go wrong, right? Plus, maybe we'll talk about it in the show. The UK's just gone into its next lockdown, so that might scupper things. We may have an office animal in the studio moving forward. In two weeks from now, we may be recording this show from my kitchen with this office animal sat on my lap. We will see. Uh, so don't want to jinx two th things too much, but basically I've had no break whatsoever because I've been doubling down on uh, content to be able to schedule out uh, whilst I may have a little bit of time off in the next few weeks with this new potential of this animal. And it's not a crocodile Sweet. or anything like that. It's nothing weird. Not a lizard, anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's more By fun way, than a so, lizard, so hopefully. You, so, you, you, so you took that time that you said you were going to take off yep. to actually still work mm -hmm. just so you can get ahead of schedule yep. so you can take care of this creature that's coming your way. Yeah, it, well, freaking out, it's a dog. I don't know why I'm. Uh, I don't know why I'm trying not to jinx it so much. But yeah, we're getting an office dog, a uh, golden retriever. Right. He's going to be called Walter. Very well, he is called Walter. And uh, yeah, in a couple what? of weeks' time, a couple of weeks' time, he'll be sat here right next to me. Oh, the only other person from the UK would call their dog Walter. Why would you call him Walter? I mean, Wal really, Walter. Yep. So I can tell you, it's a simple explanation. Me and my partner, we uh, love a TV show called Breaking Bad. The main character is called Walter White. All of the golden retrievers we were looking at, we wanted a dark one, uh, but all of the ones we were looking at were all very pale. So essentially white. So that's where Walter White came from. Now, fortunately, we found a breeder last minute. Um, it's been an absolute nightmare to get hold of a dog. And I can explain why. It's probably off topic in the audience aren't that bothered about it. But it's been very difficult to get hold of uh, properly, properly bred dogs from uh, kennel club, uh, breeders, and, and all the requirements that you should go through when you purchase a dog here in the UK anyway. And so we were expecting a white dog, but now we've got this beautiful dark golden retriever. So yeah, we're picking him yeah. up in a couple of weeks. That is that is named after a fictitious drug dealer. A is that what fictitious you're scientist that just wanted to get a bit of cash in the bank to look after his family as after he passed away from um, terminal cancer. Depends how you want to look at it, Victor. That's the beauty of yeah, the show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> By the way, it's a great, it was a great show, wasn't it? I loved it. I've, I've seen it twice. Great show. Yeah, I've, I've seen the yeah. whole thing twice. By the way, and I know we're going to probably get, uh, audience is listening, so what are you going to jump into this week in sales? We're going to get into <laughs> that, but I want to say that over the last 10 days that I had off of the year, I binged on a lot of UK type, you know, uh, series here in the US. Uh, last one, I think one's called, oh. I forgot, Collateral, I think, is one that's really good. It's only four episodes, great series. But I got to see a lot. One was called Broadchurch. Mm -hmm. I got to see some of Wales. And yeah, it was gorgeous. So side note, if you need to kill some time, uh, look to some of these English series, these UK series. Very good series, man. Very well done, by the way. A lot of them are, are BBC-based, aren't they? I mean, I think Broadchurch is in North Wales, isn't it? I think it's North Wales, yes. Yeah. You so would I, know better. But I went to uni beautiful. in North Wales. I went to uni literally where all the shenanigans was. I've not seen the show, but from what I know about the show, from basically where all the shenanigans were, were happening. Okay, so uni being university and shenanigans being... <laughs> it started already. Yeah. Already three minutes in, Victor's <laughs> taking the piss out of my English, my language, our no, language. No, no. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I wouldn't do that, man. So, Will, I got to ask you first, what are your goals for this year? What are your 2021 goals, man? So... This is not going to be a satisfactory answer. And I'm probably going to put a full video together on, on this and stick it on the YouTube channel. I've not really set me goals yet because there's a couple of things, that there's a couple of deals that need to happen. Two large deals that are going to change, not necessarily change this show, but will change some of our other content. And I set my goals around uh, kind of, you know, basically what I've done, Victor, long story short, I've had a 13-month 2020. 
I'm considering January as still being part of last year. So my goals will come in in February. Uh, personal goals, though, which not to do with business, it is to continue lifting. I put on a little bit of weight. I'm still skinny as heck, but that is coming along nicely. It's the first time in my life I've managed to put on any uh, strength and weight. And that's really helping in jujitsu and, and different sports that I do out of um, the, the world of sales. And then to spend time with this dog. My main goal out of business is I've never had a dog before. I've never had anything other than, and I feel like we should have like a small violin playing in the background here. I've never had any pet of a Victor other than a, a goldfish. And my dad killed the last goldfish. My dad. Hey, by the way, uh, uh, Adam, <laughs> Adam, if you're editing this, can you just add some violin yeah. music in the background at this very moment? Please add some violin music. <laughs> yeah, I've only really ever had a goldfish, so I'm really looking forward to the dog. It's a big responsibility. It's big. Um, it's a big thing for me and my partner. It kind of brings us together in the first part of our family. So yeah, that's that's the other goal of the year to have a, 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 a legit office dog that can can be in the office environment and, and hang out all day. All right. Well, I look forward to meeting Walter and finding out what those February goals are going to be, man. That ought to be cool. Mine are very simple. Uh, I I just, if you see over my, and you won't be able to see it cause if, you, if you're listening to this, but you see over this, my Sales After Dark, episode 102. Do you see right next to that? That's a champagne bottle I popped on episode 100, Sales After Dark. I did it, Will. I said I was going to do 100 episodes. Thank you very much. I even wore a tuxedo that night. Mm-hmm for that episode. And so that, that was one of the big goals this year. And I think that uh, this falls under the, the, the title of good things happen when you put a value out there in the market. And so good things began to happen because of, <clears throat> excuse me, because of the free show. And so new, new goals for this year are one, I'm going to do two webinars, paid webinars a month. I'm going to charge for these things. Right. And I've committed to two a month. I've been putting it off. You know, I want to go virtual hundred yep. percent. This is part of putting the stake in the ground. Sales after dark, I was doing it three times a week. We're pulling that back to once a week. Keep it. I'm obviously going to hang out with you once a week on this week in sales. That's a highlight for me. Uh, I'm going to continue to do the interviews as well. And the new the new stretch goal for me is I'm going to do two Spanish sales interviews wow. every month in Espanol. So it, that those are the, it sounds like a lot of goals, but it really is. It's really continue doing a lot, but scale back on sales after dark. Do some webinars, two a month. Do the Spanish interviews, and we'll go from there. Now, how's you, that for an agenda? It's awesome. Do you have any branding for the webinars? Uh, you know, your your live YouTube videos, sales after dark. Do you have a branding mm-hmm. set up for mm-hmm. the webinars yet? No, we're still going to keep on the Sales Velocity Academy. We don't know what title to play with yet. Uh, the first one's called. Uh, it's on the fifteenth. It's called uh, the Virtual Engagement Masterclass. Cool. I couldn't get more creative than that. But it's all about <laughs> all the stuff I learned about sales after dark and how do you engage an audience. I, especially in the live stream, and then how do you use that in a presentation slash sales format? And it's, it's going to be really interesting. You know, I got I learned a lot, uh, and then working with, with yourself and just using virtual. You know, you just add to the toolbox. So I think this. I don't think I know it's going to be a great class. So if anybody's thinking about you really going virtual, I think this is a good master class. Cool. We'll link it in the show notes, but tell us where we can find <laughs> it as well, Victor. Cool. We'll give them a discount code too, just for them. Yep. And pl- plug the plug the URL. Where can we find it? salesvelocity.com forward slash capital V, capital E, capital M. Perfect. As I said, we'll leave that in the show notes as well. And um, yeah, anything else you want to share or drop on us before we jump into it, mate? No, man. Uh, maybe I drank too much wine <laughs> and I, sh- I I think I put on one or two pounds that I need to get rid of. That's about it. Other than nice. that, I think we should jump into this thing. Good stuff. Well, hit us up with these, the first bit of news, Victor. Well, I found it. I found these stats from, you know, saleshacker.com. And it said, you know, title is 15 sales statistics that will change how you think about revenue in 2021 by Colin Campbell, uh, written at the end of the year. So uh, they had 15 stats. Here are the top five that I thought were interesting and they highlighted 40% of businesses did not meet revenue targets in 2020. Does that number surprise you, the 40%? Well, I don't know. And I'm, I don't know where this data has come from, but I've seen multiple different data points from different countries, Mm -hmm. different uh, brands, different organizations, and none of them are around 40%. They're all over the place. So it doesn't surprise me because I'm not sure how, I don't know who's got the right answer with this. So it's difficult to be surprised by, if that makes sense. I think I feel, I I feel the same way. Second data point. Did you know that 25% of sales reps believe they have not received enough training. 
what a bunch of wankers <laughs> on the <Equity> orange. <laughs> Look, let me just say this. I got to say this. Well, I'm going out. I'm going. I'm going for it's the beginning of the year. If you're a salesperson, you're complaining about sales training, given all the content online, given great courses that Will offers, I offer this week in sales. What do you mean there's not enough sales training? Why are you waiting for anybody to give you sales training? Go out and get it. Take responsibility and ownership for being in sales. Wankers. <laughs> that's that's the most aggressive word I've ever heard you say. Like even on the sh- pre-recorded on the show after, I feel you, I feel you straight. You feel I. It looks like you feel strongly about this, Victor. I do, I do, I do. This my, my street side came out. My Chicago <laughs> inner city came out on that one because I'm like, I read that. I go really? You're gonna blame somebody else for your lack yeah. of ability. Third bullet point: sixty eight percent of B two B customers are lost because of indifference not mistakes. And I was like, what, what does that mean? They're lost because of indifference, not mistakes. And I think maybe they're confused in terms of where to go, left or right, given the pandemic. That's my thought. So I, I, I wanted to double down on this idea of indifference because mm-hmm. if somebody is indifferent, they've not been sold. That's the whole point of sales, right? To educate someone so that they either choose to work with you or they don't. Clearly getting people or disqualifying people rapidly is valuable as well as a salesperson. So that it says 62, 68% of BT customers are lost because of indifference, not mistakes. Well, if you've not been sold and you've not educated the customer to one way or another, if they're indifferent of your product, then you have made a mistake. Something's gone horribly wrong at some point in the sales cycle. Am I am I getting this, my kind of a perspective yeah, on this wrong? I, or is that about I, right? I, 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 th- I, th- I think what you're saying is that the people who actually were part of the statistics are also wankers <laughs> for blaming the customer and instead of blaming yep. themselves for not presenting enough value. Yep. Is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll leave it at that. Uh, this one, number four. Seventy percent of businesses claim that their that social referrals convert faster than any other type of lead. I thought that was interesting, you know, compared to maybe like a personal lead, maybe a social referral. I believe that. I didn't I didn't know it was that high though. That's pretty high. So my question on this video is, what the heck is a social referral? Is this me tweeting Victor, hey, uh, Victor, you should buy this product? Because that's going to be massively high because it happens once every seven years because it's it's going to be so rare that it's actually going to happen, something like that. Or or am I getting what a social referral is uh, wrong? No, I think you got it right. But, but, you know, in my head, I was thinking, okay, it's like if I said, hey, uh, if you're looking for some great sales training program, I need you to look at Will Barron's content, his new platforms, doing some great things, and I send it to somebody specifically. I think that's how I viewed it, that it's sure. very targeted, very specific, and I identify the person for you. I like that. Uh, last bullet point, and again, there's 15 sales stats. These are just five. 35% of people decide whether or not to open an email based on the subject line alone. I mean, is there anything really new in that? So uh, this is another one. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure on some of these data points. I know you didn't uh, write them, Victor, but uh, you're you're throwing them at me, so I'll comment on them. How often do you delete an email without clicking open and at least skimming the body, or opening it and just seeing who it's from, or opening it and seeing that it's just one line or, or a thousand lines that you're never going to read? Do you regularly delete emails just on the subject line and the person who's sending it alone? Those two things, yes, I do. So I never Subject do that at all. And no, you open them. Yeah. So I might open them and, and barely read it. And maybe this is a muscle memory thing as well of click. And maybe the I, I'm trying to think of the UI in Gmail now. Maybe I've got it set up so I open it and then click delete as opposed to we're going to talk about keyboard shortcuts and things later on. Um, but maybe I do that rather than uh, use a keyboard shortcut. But I, I never delete an email without, for example, on the mobile, I never swipe just to delete. I'll always open it and then delete. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, some of the, the, I guess I can, you can almost smell when it's a, it's a spam sure. email. Somebody's just trying to sell you something. Uh, and usually it's all, they're always requesting something up front without even building a relationship. So it's always like, Hey, is there, you know, usually on these podcasts, for example, how, how many requests do you get for people to be on your podcast? Out of curiosity. We get about 300 like a, a month. Look at that. Yeah. Okay. I don't get that many, but I get too many. I'm, you know on, I'm I mean? on some I, list somewhere, Victor, I, where it's this person has yes. people on the show. And so it's just, it's just spam as opposed to, 
there's not 300 who are, hey, Will, we would love to kind of come on the salesman podcast. This is what we can offer and this, this and this. It's a PR person. I'm on some PR list somewhere where people will spam at Same me. here. Yeah. So, and I get about, I think I get about 50 and that's on the high side. But, uh, you know, if I would give an average, yeah, somewhere between 25 and 50, I'm in there somewhere. But as soon as I see those, I know who they're from. Yeah. And I just start deleting. And then I can tell spam. But, yeah, I delete a lot. I, By the way, I did a um, one of my uh, sales after darks. I talked about, um, you know, emails and open rates. And I forgot what the number is. I should have looked it up before I got on here. Is that if you just include the person's name, comma, subject, the open rate just goes up automatically. I want to say it was like 20, 25% or something like that. Do you know the number by chance? I don't know the number off the top of my head, but all of the emails that we send to our email list, um, this is like mm-hmm. no, no secret for anyone who's on it. It's always name dash subject line every time, every single email. It doesn't matter whether we're selling something, promoting a podcast episode, whatever it is, it's always name dash. And we've just found from our testing years ago, hopefully it's still valid now, but years ago that that was the best way to increase open rates. Just such a simple, uh, simple automated step. And the day I looked at it was about a month ago. So I think it's still recent. I think, I, I think it still works. And I think it was 20, 25%, something like that. But you know, that right there is a great tip from this week in sales. <laughs> By the Simple way, uh, if you want to leave any feedback or comments, they should go to thisweekendsales.com and let us know what you think of this podcast. Good stuff. What next, Will? Let's move on to Sales Loft, who have raised $100 million for its digital sales platform. And I put this in just because the numbers fascinate me with these uh, fast-growing sales tech startups. They're now valued at $1.1 billion. Now, these numbers don't really mean anything to me. A thousand million is so beyond my ability to mm-hmm. grasp that, um, that it, it's, it's insane. Now, sales loft for people who are unaware, they provide AI, I'm quoting here, so it'll sound very markety, provides AI-based tools to help salespeople run their sales processes virtually, from finding and following up on leads through to helping them sell with virtual, virtual coaching tools. Um, and this is all, a lot of their growth has come about and this new funding has come on the back of uh, Kyle Porter here, the CEO, says the effects of COVID have been a tailwind due to the digital to the effects of digital selling. So as everyone works from home, we need tools like SalesLoft, mm-hmm. Outreach.io, many, many other cat- uh, brands and companies within this category of sales enablement. And he says, quote again, all sellers immediately became remote. It meant that inside sales were now all sales, whether opportunities are mid-funnel, upgrades, or renewals. So I thought the numbers were insane. I thought that was interesting. And congratulations on Sales Loft on the round of financing. But I wanted to ask you this, Victor. Is that statement true from Kyle? Are all sellers now remote? I think so. And you, you, we're going to hear a word. Like, I think 2020, the word that was abused was pivot. Pivot was abused in 2020. The word I project, I'm, I'm forecasting again because you know it's always about making a prognostication on this show. That the word that will be abused in 2021, within the context of selling, will be the word hybrid. You keep hearing all about hybrid meetings, hybrid sales for hybrids going to be abused, and and these are people who are somewhat optimistic that we're going to go back, or they're yearning to go back, have sure. not kind of accepted the fact that we may not be going back. And so I get it. I actually agree with this. I think the um, it, let's just use the 80 20 rule to be safe here. 80% of the people are still going to be remote by the end of the year. That's my forecast. So, uh, Kyle Porter, CEO, I, I am with you 80% of the way on this. Uh, and I think my, my question to you on this one, Will, was so you look at this hundred million dollars, as you say, a thousand million or a hundred billions, uh, and they're valued at 1.1 billion, rather, right? Sure. And so what's the play here? Because that's a lot of money. Are they are they trying to catch are they are they seeing Salesforce as a proof of concept? Like, hey, they did it. Let us do it. And now they're trying to ride sales law. And I'm not dissing sales law. I'm complimenting them because they say, hey, let's move into this space. And we got some investors. And if somebody's giving them a hundred million, Will, sales law must be doing a lot of things right. What say you? So I just quickly Googled then Outreach, who are the, from from everything I've read, are the market leaders in that category. They mm-hmm. raised, they've raised in total 289 million and they were valued at 1.1 billion last April in, oh no, April, sorry, in 2019. 
So who knows what they're valued at right now? Um, so I, the answer to the, your question is, Victor, the end goal is for all these companies is it has to be when you venture, when you're using venture capital, it has to be get bought out or IPO. There's no other option. The only reason people are invest, I, I don't know, you know this, but just for the audience, the only reason that uh, angel investors, venture capitalists, and then at this point, banks uh, and larger organizations will throw money at these companies is because they feel like they're on such a, a rapid period of growth that when they do IPO, they're going to IPO for 20, 20 billion as opposed to just 1 billion. And so they're going to get a 20x return on the cash that's invested uh, on, on the back of things. And of course, lots of these companies never IPO. They never, or they do get sold, but a much lower valuation later on in the, the, the business's life cycle. So that's the only two outcomes for them. And this is why I, I don't know about yourself, but I've never taken on any capital. I've been offered capital uh, numerous times from uh, angel investors down to organizations who wanted to buy into the product uh, and, and the business and not buy the whole thing. And it's because I don't want I don't want the pressures of rapid growth because immediately your customer is a shareholder at this point as opposed to the end user of your product. And so it skews everything. And so it's one of those games. You either go in and you win massive or you, you go in and you get nothing out the other end. Yeah, I mean, I, well said, by the way, well explained. And, and I think this pandemic and I think what Porter's trying to say is that has opened up a wider breach in the need has made space for new competitors to walk in. Every Everybody's waiting for Salesforce to fall on their face. That's how it usually works, right? The leader, wait for them to fall, stumble, you know, give poor customer service, have poor customer experience, fall behind the technology. And these companies are now sensing a moment here. I think sales loft investors are sensing a moment. They're going, okay, if they're going to go remote, we know we're not going to go back. Even if we decide to go back, it'll be a hybrid, right? So... I think it's a good move. I think it's a good move. I think it's good investment for them. Sure. I, this is me telling them it's a good investment. Yeah. <laughs> but and the issue is, the issue still remains, one of these organizations will become the next Salesforce if the IPO and they do and they have success from that standpoint. And then the you know the, the the industry standard for multiple years, decades even to come. Now, which one of them becomes the industry standard? Which one of them gathers enough ground? We see this with Gong and Chorus and other brands doing exactly the same product, just spinning it off in different directions right now. So it's interesting to me, and I, I love this uh, kind of watching from afar with uh, you know skin in the game. I guess I should say a bunch of those companies have sponsored podcasts and, and content we've done in the past, uh, just for in case anyone wants to kind of criticize my judgment on things but i tend to i, I like watching all this from from afar because i, I find the it's almost like a war it's, it's a it, if i'm trying to compete with a small to medium business on a sales training contract for an organization it's a zero-sum game one of us is going to win it we move on to the next one these guys are playing at such a high level and one deal you know if they started providing uh, sales enablement services for ibm or so on it could be worth $200 million over the course of the lifetime. It's such a different, massive game. I love watching all this from afar, which is why I try and include some of these in the in the mm -hmm. docs and in, in this in this week in sales. No, this is a good one because I, I when I look at this, it is kind of a game of attrition, right? Sure. That some of these companies are going to survive, some are not. But I'm also thinking it from a, you know, having sold software like yourself, been in sales, you're going, okay, you're going to try to move into a space where it's hard to get a customer to switch over because they have so much invested already sunk costs into a platform already. So I'm wondering, you know, you got to have a great sales force to actually move people off of mm -hmm. Salesforce, moves people off of another, like a, like a, a hub spot or whatever it may be. So that'll be interesting to see what they do, but Hey, here's a new topic for us. And I was inspired by this new topic by a customer who I did a presentation for a company called, I can call it, call them out uh, a company called Enersys. Enersys is a fascinating business because it's all the batteries that run infrastructure. We're not talking about just Tesla. We're talking about infrastructure. Uh, the president of the company, uh, uh, who I've known for like 25 years, we were calculating, but I haven't seen him in almost as long, like 23 years. <laughs> and, and so he reached out and said, Victor, hey, here's our, here's our business. Here's what we're doing. And so he's in the telecom business, all infrastructure. Because there are, you know, these outside plant cabinets, these nodes outside, yep. in other words, from the head end, nodes, split the, the channels, the whole bit. And more and more, the demand for power, battery, portable, uninterruptible power is just blowing up massively. But in his position, his company has to sell through distributors, which becomes a very, now I know you understand this market, selling through distributors and not to the end user is a different play. 
And so we have not talked about what happens when you try to sell through channels. So I came across this company and it had this whole thing about, it's called Allbound and PRM is the platform for successful partnerships. And then I put the question here is like, uh, this, it's going to be a CRM like platform for channel sales. That's the best way I can define it. And I thought this was really, inter really interesting. So I'll read partner relationship management, almost like a CRM, but this time it's partner relationship management, a PRM enables you to optimize relationship with resellers and distributors so you can focus your time on other channel efforts, right? Simplify, digitize your entire partner life cycle with all bounds partner PRM software. And this part's interesting from partner onboarding to, to enablement to marketing collaboration. That's the big part. And maybe co-op dollars and deal registrations. Because one of the things a lot of companies struggle with as they're selling through channels is how do I gain their their, their mind share, right? Because they're trying to sell a bunch of stuff and I'm trying to get them to sell my stuff specifically. Then they work out deals where they try to give them money. You also try to put collateral so they can do the branding, almost white labeling the collateral. So this platform seems to be able to manage all that for them. And I think it's really fascinating because I've not seen a PRM discussion on this show. Did we break some new ground, Will? <laughs> I think we did. <laughs> so I, I love this for numerous reasons. I love the the brand name, All Bound, is very clever and mm -hmm. succinct. And I like this. There's probably a name for this in the in marketing speak of uh, what they've done here of PRM of basically take it is a CRM basically, isn't it? With stuff stuck onto it, but they've took it into a separate niche and they've named it something different. So this is why we call, uh, or I don't know, I assume it's the same in the US. We call here in the UK a vacuum cleaner a Hoover because they were the first people in the marketplace, uh, or one of the first brands in the marketplace, one of the first mass market vacuum cleaners. And so ubiquitously now we call them Hoovers. Same with, uh, you might say, grab the Dyson, even though it's a brand that looks like a Dyson and it'd be uh, clear and of whatever weird v vacuum suction systems that Dyson claim to have uh, painted and used in their products. So I feel like they're probably trying to do the same here. If you can get that mind share of all bound, yo, they do partner relationship management. As soon as someone tries to say, oh, we also do partner relationship management, you're the second player. And so immediately, even if you're a better company, bigger product, uh, or bigger company, better product, you seem like you're in second place. So I think that's really clever. That's what interesting. They're doing here. I, didn't, I didn't look at it that way. That's, that's really a nice twist on that. So check it out all about, and maybe this will be one of those, this could be the next salesforce.com, allbound.com. And if they do blow up, they should give us credit, Will. I'm not <laughs> throw that back out there again. I'm just I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't remember getting any hold, credit I'm for anything, Victor. For show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next up, another acquisition uh, on the technology side of things. Big Tin Can acquires ClearSlide. Um, ClearSlide uh, does basically sales enablement, all kinds of different sales enablement from the uh, in engagement with the user to kind of further down the sales pipeline. And I believe, I don't, I'm not that familiar with Big Tin Can, but they do things after the sale and uh, more of a training perspective on the enablement side. So uh, another quote here, the addition of ClearSide technology extends Big Tin Can's end-to-end -end SaaS stack with access to buyer engagement analytics, email timing, and personalized video communication. So I put this one in. Um, so congratulations to uh, the executives, I guess, over at ClearSlide. Um, I, I guess I should probably say as well, ClearSlide has sponsored content and podcasts and things we've done in the past on uh, Salesman.org and Salesman Podcast, just to be clear. And I wanted to put this one in, Victor, because this is what we've been talking about. This is what we have been predicting. Brands that own a part of the sales cycle or a part of the uh, buying cycle, however we want to frame things up, buying brands that cover other parts of it and um, coming up with an end-to-end -end solution that benefits both both companies and the end users as well and pulling everything in and amalgamating it into just one uh, mega software solution. Um, so I wanted to get your thoughts on that, Victor. Is this something that we, I feel like we've talked about this before, but is this something we're going to see more and more of? First of all, we did predict this, <laughs> that this type of, this and it's a general prediction, right? This type of consolidation is going to begin to happen. Uh, instead of building it, people are going to start bolting in things yep. to, as you say, create this uh, amalgamated complete system. And so, you know, congratulations to Big Tin Can. Uh, it'll continue to happen. Big Tin Can might actually be bought out by somebody else. Maybe they're viewing it uh, as what I could add more value to my company. That's one way. The other is maybe there's a certain market segment they're getting access to that'll probably help them as well. So this is interesting. This is, uh, it is what we've been talking about. I think it's fascinating. I'm telling you this, you know, 
five years from now, if that, this landscape will have a lot of, I'll just say, dead corporate bodies, and you'll see who's been left standing. And I think AI is really driving a lot of these companies to, 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 to up their game. The question is who can do it better and who can do it more efficiently. So I think it's interesting. I really do. Two things on this. One, I find it's interesting that this is going to, I believe this is going to accelerate. So 20 years ago, if you had to have the software on a box within your own server room, clearly it's more of a pain in the ass to change products, to change uh, organizations, to change systems. I know selling medical devices into the NHS, taking an Ethernet cable and plugging it into the camera systems that I used to sell would allow surgeons to uh, get the, the videos and the pictures from the endoscopic cameras onto the hospital's systems and it would go straight into patient notes. It was super seamless. There's a few licenses that need to be bought. But IT departments did not want that to happen because as soon as it did, as soon as that cable was plugged in, they were then responsible for all this extra hardware. Now in the cloud environment that we all live in, whether you like it or not, it's very difficult to buy uh, perpetual licenses for software anymore. Everything is a monthly, everything is software as a service. To change is seemingly a lot a lot quicker and a lot easier. You could, a lot of brands and, and organizations allow you to export things because they want you to be able to not leave them, but encourage the market to export so you can leave the competitors to move over to them. So this ability for brands to just suck up a whole chunk of market is accelerating, accelerating, accelerating. I feel like the friction of changing from one brand to another is decreasing. So I thought that was interesting. And I agree, within, I don't I don't even think it's five years. Right now. I think one to three years, there's going to be some massive shakeups in, in the market that we're, we're commenting on here. But the, the second thing I wanted to ask you is, Victor Antonio, you have your YouTube channel. Um, you have masses of attention on there, on your your podcast and everywhere else. So you're driving loads of inbound leads, right? So you own your marketing, you own, you, you own the inbound funnel. You do training products, whether that be live webinars, uh, the online training, uh, in-person, or I guess less in-person, but uh, speeches on stage, and then also coaching calls and other things as well. What company would you buy, Victor? Seems as you own so much of the, uh, the sales funnel already, what, not necessarily a brand specifically, but what type of company would you buy if you had unlimited cash to bolster Victor Antonio Enterprises and to drive more revenue in your machine? Uh, I would buy a uh, Gartner. <laughs> I, I would buy Gartner if I had. You said if I had money, I'd buy Gartner. Uh, okay, I, I, okay, I, fine, would, fine. What what would you do with Gartner? How how would they add value to Victor Antonio Enterprises? They already, to, to me, I would view them as a company that already has won the credibility, but also has the portfolio, already has the connection into these companies. So I, I, I would be buying it for the contact. Now, the fact that they have great content and the infrastructure to create that content. I mean, that right there is big. And so that's how I would view it. I mean, I, I don't know if that I, I, I'm thinking too big here, but you said unlimited. Right. So I'm thinking, hey, let me go. Let me ring the bell <laughs> on this one. Uh, you know, because uh, I, I love what they're doing. I love the, the content they put out and they become almost like the standard de facto. Of like if you make their their quadrant, you know, or any place on their quadrant, you're like, whoa, that's like validation. I did want to add a question uh, back to you is that you so you make the you made the statement that these acquisitions, right? These, these consolidation are much easier. So what do you think? It's an opinion. Do you think, you know, when we, we talk about mergers and acquisition, the failure rates are so high, you know, and I don't know what the latest numbers are, but they're very high. What do you think that, will that impact the uh, very clear question? In today's market, do you think the merger acquisition and failure rate, based on what you said as far as, you know, ease of integration will go down? Your thoughts? I don't know. I have no idea because I've never done uh, too far into this. But I will give you a, uh, no. a, a an opinion that is unfounded on any evidence. Let's frame it up like that. Mm -hmm. I would say hesitantly that the the success rate would go up as brands standardize to the same way of pricing a monthly per individual per seating pricing. That makes uh, valuing organizations much more simple as everyone is basically using uh, Google, Amazon, and probably one or two other suppliers of cloud services for the backbone of, uh, you know, if it, I, I don't know this for a fact, but Outreach probably uses a, a cloud service to host and provide the, the their infrastructure as opposed to building infrastructure themselves. Uh, as an example, as I said, I don't know that, that to be true, but uh, a lot of brands will do that. 
I think it's going to become easier to merge all these technologies as a APIs become more and more common and ubiquitous between, between these larger organizations. Uh, we, we're getting pressure at our end to add the ability to API into our uh, sales coach training because different organizations want it on their own intranet or internal dashboards. And we, our companies are like tiny. There's, there's, there's like no value in our organization uh, whatsoever. So if we're getting pressured for APIs, these big players are as well. So to answer your question, I would suggest based on no evidence whatsoever, just a hunch here, that acquisitions would become easier to do because of because of all those factors. Everything's becoming more public and open. There's less secrets. There's less, uh, you know, you might say you've got unique IP, but if it's, you know, if it's code, a lot of it can be kind of reverse engineered. And so, yeah, from I would say that it would become easier rather than more difficult. I, I would agree with you. Because the big question would be, then become is if I uh, acquire ClearSide, how do I put them into my marketing mix and then eventually my sales mix? In other words, how do I leverage what they've already done? And then how do I complement that with what I'm currently trying to sell? So I'm with you, man. And guess what? I found something on productivity that I want to talk about. Nice. Anyway, so I came across this. And this came out on December 8th, but I thought it was still valid. Let's talk about this. Harvard Business for you. What super productive people do differently? Well, Baron, by Dr. Amantha Imber. Uh, so here are three tips that stood out. I just thought, I just said that. These are good. The first one is batch your meetings. Now, I don't really need to explain that one, but I thought this was interesting. Just like you would batch your meetings, uh, you're going to batch your uh, or batch your email review. Batching meetings, calls, or virtual events can be equally effective as compared to doing it with your emails. Research from Ohio State University has shown that when we have a meeting coming up in the next hour or two, we get 22% less work done compared to when we have no upcoming meetings at all. So in other words, stacking them makes it more, makes you more efficient. And we've all had those moments where you don't want to start something because <laughs> you got to get on the meeting later yep. on. And so what do, what do you think of that data point? That's an interesting data point. It makes total sense. I know I uh, one of my failures in the past, less so now, I've trained it out myself, was I would procrastinate. I would have difficulty getting started doing a task and there's loads of brain science on why this is a thing it's not it's not uh it's a physical phenomenon in your brain and, and switching tasks uh, does take up mental energy that otherwise can be used on, on other things but one of the things as i said i would procrastinate on starting a task so i found early on in my career just in, in work in general that if i batch them together that initial momentum of getting started i don't find that then for each individual task i can just rattle through them um so that's incredibly valuable i mean it's common sense but it's valuable. Yeah, not so common. I actually learned to appreciate that more as we moved into this virtual space more. You know what I mean? Because then I found myself, oh, let me just stack them and get them all out of the way. And so that hit me. Uh, the second point here, this was interesting. Uh, again, under the, uh, the topic of being productive, avoid using the mouse. A study by Brainscape found that most people lose an average of two seconds that's how much detail we're getting into here at This Week in Sales. Please go to thisweekinsales.com. Leave us your feedback, especially on this one. Uh, two seconds per minute of work by using their mouse instead of the keyboard shortcut. That's eight days a year. The benefits of learning keyboard shortcuts can be enormous for your productivity. Look at that. Just by using shortcuts, you can gain eight days in a whole year. I'm not sold on the, the data point here, Victor. I feel like I could just spend, I could just have a quicker shower and save 14 days a year in uh, productivity. But actually, the, the the point behind it, though, of using shortcuts, I am just a madman for using shortcuts. I use shortcuts for everything, um, especially if I do, I don't do so much anymore, but video editing, anything like that, I have to have everything set up. I don't use the mouse, I barely touch it. So let me ask you this, Victor. This is the, the shortcut challenge, right? Other than copy and paste what shortcuts do you use regularly uh let me see a uh, screenshot control all three uh, when i want to do a screenshot of something that's my favorite one right there uh you put me a uh, pressure here and this is just general ones that's my biggest one actually i think uh, con uh control q quit obviously double q for uh chrome or whatever uh that's it i mean what is she i mean I, i've never really thought about this but I'm, I'm just like, you know, I, I want to get your shortcuts, but I just want to reiterate the data point here. Is that by using a shortcut, <laughs> you save two seconds per hour, which works out to eight days uh, uh, a year. And the biggest question I had when I read this data point, like, who wants to spend time? 
calculating this stuff. I know it's Brainscape, but I'm like, yo, Brainscape, don't you have anything better to do than to do this? But anyway, <laughs> they're not going to like me after that comment. But what's your favorite shortcut, Will? Besides, you know, cut, paste, which one? So I have, I think you might actually have one. Do you have a stream deck? I do. Oh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't consider the stream there deck. You go. I didn't talk about the stream deck. So, sorry about that. So okay. I have a stream deck set stream- up just for productivity. I have it set up to launch applications rather than going. So I use Windows on uh, most of our, uh, our equipment and, and product- production gear. Other than this, I've got this one Mac in the office for Skype calls and that side of things. By the way, b- before you go any further, explain to the audience what stream deck is. So Stream Deck, um, we'll link it in the show notes. It is a keyboard, essentially. That's what it is. And and it it will pull together macros. So you press a button, you press one button, and then it triggers multiple keyboard clicks or mouse clicks or application opens in the background. Now, it was designed for live streaming. Um, A lot of people use it. Do you use, uh, I think you use Ecamm Live, don't you, rather than OBS for your streaming. Is that correct? Well, Well, two things. One, I use Ecamm Live. And, but I, I still use the Stream Deck for all my shortcuts. Yep. For so, like doing graphic overlays, videos, introductions, all that stuff. Yes. Sure. So it was originally designed for OBS, which a lot of uh, Twitch streamers and all the big gamers will use uh, to grab multiple feeds from cameras and game consoles and other things. And then they basically open sourced the back end of it. So now you can use it with, I use it with Adobe Premiere. So rather than, um, if I want to cut out a section of a video, rather than click cut, cut, click on the bit in the middle, click delete, then drag all the thing over. I think there is a shortcut that's just on the keyboard to do some of that. I automate it by just highlighting and pressing a button. So I highlight button, highlight button, highlight button, as opposed to using all of those extra steps. You can set it up for Gmail to open new email, delete email, and find email and and different things as well. So so yeah, I use a Stream Deck for a lot of that stuff. And then I use mouse keyboard uh, shortcuts for control A, select all, things like that as well. But I find it's, Even if it's not saving me time, it saves me, I feel like it saves me mental energy of mouse, look at the screen, go up to something. It's almost subconscious it comes out of me if I use a keyboard shortcut and it allows me to rattle through things, I believe, quicker. Uh, Definitely more quicker than two seconds a minute. So so, so maybe they they should have included that in their study, that it's really more than just two seconds. It's, It's the mental energy you're exhausting. Here's the last bullet point for this one on productivity again. Read your work out loud. Reading work out loud allows you to proofread more accurately. You can identify sentences that don't add value and find the optimal rhythm and pace for your work. Now, before I get your opinion, Will, I like this one. I thought it was an interesting idea because I don't usually do that. And then I just thought when I read this data point, I was like, well, I guess that does make sense. If you read it out loud, you can hear it. And then you can see where it doesn't make sense. What do you think? I never send an email without reading it out loud, even if, even if I'm just reading it out loud really? in my head as opposed to physically using my mouth. Because I can, again, you subconsciously just dump stuff on uh, the, through a keyboard onto the screen. I will sit and read it as if I'm talking to a person because I'm a terrible speller. I have terrible grammar. I have. Uh, I think I'm quite a decent writer, and we've had plenty. I know I'm going to ask you a second uh, in a second, Victor, because you're you're an actual author as opposed to I've just done blog posts. But I've had blog posts that have had five hundred thousand views and and above, and and hundreds of comments. So I don't think I'm a terrible writer, but I am terrible at spelling, uh, grammar, and the the rules of the game, so to speak. So I find reading it out loud. We have an editor who goes through all, all the content, so you can blame her if there's any mistakes. But yeah, reading out loud gets me that first draft that isn't just total nonsense. But let me ask you, Victor, do you, you mentioned that you don't necessarily do this regularly, you're starting to do it, but do you have an editor for all your books and the content and the training, or are you are you capable of just getting stuff on a page without tons of mistakes? No, I mean, I can, if I get something on the page, it's going to be about 80 to 85% good. But I need editors to kind of clean it up. You know what I mean? And sometimes, you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what a dangling participle is, and somebody else does. So that's why you. Uh, but I, by the way, my favorite website. Let's throw out a resource here. I use Upwork. Upwork.com is where you can hire somebody to actually do it. Uh, so you know what I do is I upload a one page of my manuscript, and then people edit that one page so I can see how they edit it. And I always had a little note: smooth out my sentences. That's the phrase I always do: smooth out some of my sentences. And what I the reason I do that will is because I I want to give people license to kind of make that sentence a little better, and I love when some people just go in and change a couple of words. You're like, oh, that does sound better. That's the editor I'm looking for. 
So, you know, my English, by the way, I was C student, barely. In college, in high school and college, I was a C student when it came to English. So I'm with you, brother. I'm with you. <laughs> so we, we use at work for a lot of our team members as well, so I can highly recommend it. And if you come across and used, and this has been a sponsor of the show, uh, just to be clear, have you used the platform or the app Grammarly? Yes, I do. I love Grammarly. Yeah, so we, Grammarly I use that saved, as well. You don't have Grammarly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. By the way, Grammarly has saved me <laughs> countless times. So big shout out to Grammarly. And, you know, initially when I started, you know, when it, when it started appearing and I downloaded it, it was kind of annoying because it's almost like reminding you that you're an idiot. You're <laughs> like, well, thanks for that. But you realize that, yeah, they have your best interests in mind. They just want to make you sound good, you know, within the email. But I, I love Grammarly. I think that's it's a great concept. Uh, I don't really understand how they generate revenue. I think you have to upgrade to a certain level of service and it's a subscription model. But I love the fact that they give it away for free so you can play with it. And that's a good company. Uh, you know, we should do something on Grammarly. We should actually look into that company a little bit more just to kind of understand their business model and, you know, how they're making money. Sure. So, so I pay for way, a membership there, Victor, but I, I can't remember what I get from it. I think I've got, I got a reduced rate through the sponsorship and stuff as well. So, uh, but yeah, it's like I pay like four quid, five quid a month or something like that. Okay. Hey, by the way, maybe we, I, I want to put this out here for our listeners. We should have a sec a segment. I'm just by the way, I'm just totally brainstorming. We've got blindside will right now. Maybe we should have a segment. I'm not saying we have to do it every time, every week, but maybe have a segment. In, How do they make money? Segment. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> How do they make money? And find these companies that you like. Oh, how do they make money? I'm I'm putting it out there. Uh, love to get your opinion. Thisweekinsales.com. That is Victor, a TV show. If anyone who doesn't realize this, Victor is a TV superstar, right? I don't, that I is don't, a TV. No, super, TV, not a superstar, though. No, not a superstar. Oh, by the way, can I, can I share some uh, side news with you? So Grant Cardone just did something called Undercover Billionaire. Yep. I don't know if you saw it. So, I don't know if you saw that. I've right? not seen it yet. So no spoilers, Victor. Okay. So no, 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 no spoilers. But little known fact, that they reached out to me in, I think it was January, February. And they were, cause it's, it's a different person every time. And what they do is they drop you in the city with a hundred bucks. Right. And then you got, you got to help a company build a company million dollars. And so they approached me in February, like early February, late January, early February. And I guess they saw my other reality show yeah. life or debt. And they're like, do you want to do this? And I'm like, what's, what's the concept? Well, we're going to drop you in the city, hundred bucks. It's all you got. You got to figure the rest out. And I had to say no. I mean, it was tempting, but one, it took, it was like three months out of my life. Sure. And in the end of January, February, I was doing, I already had so many bookings that I, and contracts in place I couldn't cancel. But anyway, big shout out to Grant Cardone and uh, Undercover Billionaire of the show. I just think it's fascinating, but I, it's how do they make money. I think it's, it's a fascinating concept. Yeah. Uh, and I said, I feel like that could be a TV show uh, or a, a docu-series in its own right. We would find organizations that have, Massive offices that no one's ever heard of that make billions. Mm -hmm. One example would be yeah. my first ever sales job that I got sacked from it was a brand, uh, an organization called Johnson Mathy. No one's ever heard of them. They're an insanely massive company. They own mines that dig platinum, gold, palladium, silver. And I was selling. What's the name? Uh, Johnson Mathy. Okay, I thought I said Murphy. I said, yes, shoe company? No. So, <laughs> well, Johnson, so if you've ever looked up, Victor, the price of gold or silver, you're probably looking at data from Johnson Mathy. They own so much of the marketplace uh, for mining that all the data and all the numbers come from them. But no one's ever heard of them. It's like, I think it's like, I'm, I'm butchering the numbers here slightly, and this was like 10 years ago, but it was 80% of catalyt catalytic converters in cars use platinum and palladium from Johnson Mathy which is obviously a mega business. I was selling a palladium to the pharmaceutical industry to use it as a catalyst. And you, you'd you be literally selling five, six kilo, it would come in a tub and they're like 50, 100 grand depending on the, the metal that's in there. It's insane. Yeah. So that'd be cool to look at companies like yeah. that that have, again, massive offices, massive footprints, but no one's ever heard of them. Yeah, that'd be great, right? I don't know. Might be an interesting topic. Let's give it some thought, Will. Let's give it some thoughts. Okay. Next Let's give it. Next up. Here's, and this is the title of this uh, post here, here's how we leveraged experience management to adapt. And I'll explain what experience management is in a second. And this is written by Brody Clemmer, who's a senior product manager over at Richardson Sales Performance. And I'm quoting, before the pandemic, 90% of our sales training 
uh, this is from Richardson, sales performance, was instructor-led and in-person. Now, none of it is. So no great surprise there. We used experienced management software to monitor the experiences of our participants during training. Now, this is basically a fancy way of saying that they give out surveys at the end of a training and they sussed out what worked, what didn't. Now, Qualtrics is the brand of uh, survey software that they used. So they used Qualtrics and we asked our clients about their newly online learning journey and then used that data to compare previous instructor-led sessions with online training and found the gaps between the two. So Victor, I wanted to ask you, mate, what do you think the gaps would be between a company that traditionally charges an awful lot to do in-person training over multiple days versus online sessions, which they immediately had to pivot to during the, the COVID pandemic mm -hmm. after these surveys? What do you think was the, the gaps between the two types of training? In terms of efficiency or effectiveness? In terms of efficiency, effectiveness, uh, I guess, a, a opinion, uh, anything, the user adoption of the training itself? I would think, and I haven't looked at the data point. I haven't cheated. So I'm guessing here, okay? So I haven't cheated. Uh, I would think that, God, I, I want to guess. Let me just guess. I, I'm going to say that there was a 10 to 20% increase in sales performance using remote, virtual. So, so what? Right, I'll, I'll, re, I'll rephrase that, the question. That, that silence, that, that <laughs> silence was too long. But go ahead. <laughs> I'll rephrase the question. So, the, they are doing in-person sales training. They're doing online right. sales training, essentially virtual sales right. training. They uh, they gave out surveys of how effective was in-person training, how effective was online training, and they're looking for gaps between the two. So, I'll I'll, I'll tee you up here. Um, and they didn't share all of the data points, but one of them they found was that prior to COVID nineteen. Clients and instructors would rather gather in hotel rooms for active trading sessions that lasted one or two days, eight hours each. Now, they found that doing that online wasn't effective. What the users or the, the salespeople who were being trained wanted instead was two-hour chunks over four days. So that was one of the data points they pulled out from comparing, uh, from surveying in person to, to virtual. Um, th there's a few other things that they, they found as well, but I just thought this was an interesting approach. And clearly it's an obvious thing that we should all be doing if we've made that pivot. Because it's it's sometimes easy though to go, well, we're still getting revenue by doing the same thing, but online. But clearly it may be more effective, it may be less effective. And we don't know until we've AB'd it compared to what we were doing previously. Yeah, I, I think that's where I was going to. I said, which is more effective? So let's say they chunked it out, you know, uh, uh, two hours over four four days. But then one could argue both ways. One is that the downside of that is that, hey, you know, we were on a roll, we were really learning, you know, and then we interrupted our learning. That's one way of thinking. Or you can look at it from a positive side. Hey, the fact that we're chunking it, the absorb absorption rate is much higher. Therefore, that retention rate, and I can amplify. So, yeah, I feel like we need to know more what's happening. Let's call it, dear Richardson, please provide <laughs> more information to this week in sales. Yeah. So and, anyway, and, and they did I, outline, I Victor, that they found that uh, it was more effective doing the online training because they could use then uh, online worksheets. And uh, I don't want to plug it, but over at Sellsman.org, we use, rather than just giving you a printout or something you'd print out as a PDF, the worksheets after each of our videos are interactive. You get to type in there, there's, depending on what you're trying to do in different workshops, there's calculators and different tools that are baked in there as well. So I assume they're doing something similar there. Yeah, they say, and we used other yeah. tools to boost interactivity as well. So just in a room, I mean, you can do way, certain things. Sure. No, no, I'll say, explain a little further, you know, you know what you're doing. I think that's pretty interesting because the more you can make it interactive, maybe there's more stickiness to it because mm -hmm. of what you just said. Like give an example of what you have in your platform that you were just describing. Like walk through one of those simple ones. Sure. So we uh, we just published a new training or an updated training on uh, selling on LinkedIn, social selling, right? So mm -hmm. one of the videos, uh, one of the top videos on there is uh, it goes through how to build out your profile, how to add keywords in to, so you come up in searches for, uh, if people are searching for, if I'm selling medical devices, you want to come up as medical advice salesperson and, and different keywords like that. Now, once you watch the video, and as you're watching the video, we encourage you to take notes in a, in a box underneath it, and it stores your notes in there. So if you come to watch the video again, perhaps you can skim the video and look through your notes. On the next page, as you click through, it gives you an interactive worksheet. So that then breaks down essentially everything that needs to go on your LinkedIn profile. You'll type in keywords, you'll type in uh, industries, who you want to be in front of. And then at the bottom, it amalgamates all of that into a, a chunk of content that can go straight onto, onto your LinkedIn profile using uh, 
it's not really an algorithm. It's just this plus this plus this plus this. Uh, but it does a lot of the legwork of typing for you, essentially, and gives mm -hmm. you a good framework to put on your LinkedIn profile. So that'd be something that's interactive. Now, mm -hmm. you could teach that someone in person and you could walk them through each of the steps. But the problem of doing it in person is each person is going, well, I've got a question about this. I've got a question about that. I've got a question about this. And so it's going to take you three hours to get through one simple exercise. Whereas when it's put online, and this is where you've got to have a learning designer who the the job and skill is creating content and training that is um, that goes into your brain and sticks in there. There's you know it's, it's it's an art and a science. So that's it's beyond my kind. Of, I I dump the script down. Our learning designer then goes through and makes it actually useful and uh, and good training content. But it allows you to do all this seamlessly on a interactive form and page as opposed to struggling to get through this in person with everyone raising the question and, and having uh, uh raising the hand and having different questions yeah i, I love that by the way I, no that's a great explanation i think you know because we don't think about that so i'm glad you walked through that explanation love that uh sounds like a great course by the way the the fact that you're actually doing it you know what i mean and it's you it's yours and you can see it yep. and i would argue with you by the way this plus that plus that plus that is an algorithm <laughs> uh so <laughs> But but I think that's I think maybe that's what Richardson's getting to. The more that he can do that interactive stuff and you know interplay, it's not just receiving information. Yep. What you're describing is actually now you got to feed that back, so to speak, and that's the feedback loop. And so I love that, man. Great idea. Great idea. Hey, more on your sales game and up in your sales game besides going into w Will's system. They also have this new book by my man Brandon Bornanson. He's the founder of Seamless.ai. The book, I got I got a preview of this book about a month ago. Uh, whatever it takes, master the habits to transform your business, relationships, and life. Now, let me, uh, so here's his description. And then I'm going to give you my take on, uh, on Brandon. I'm going to give you the inside dope on Brandon. Okay, Brandon Bornanson graduated college, flat broke. He started a business that was an epic failure. Love that admission. A little self-deprecation before. Then he turned it all around before he was 30, closing over $100 million in sales. So he came from a sales background uh, for Google and IBM and founding two multi-million dollar companies. The second uh, the second named him LinkedIn's top 50, was named LinkedIn's top 50 startups. Now, two things. One, have you have you interviewed a Brandon on your Salesman podcast? Yep. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts? Give me your thoughts on, on Brandon. Because I mean, I think he's an awesome guy. Yep. And I love his energy. And... I don't know if you have you heard his college story. No, the college story is the best. Oh, well, he he highlights this in a book. It's a amazing story. But your 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 thoughts on Brandon? Because I really like him. I love the book. I'm recommending it. But I'm gonna put. I'm gonna be very specific here. I I I got a lot of sales tips on there. They're in there. But what I loved about the book was it was like it was very inspirational. Do you know what I mean? It's almost like the hero story. Hero got killed. Came back to life. <laughs> got killed. Came back to life. And he's building this large company. And to me, that was like, oh, this is awesome. This guy's really going for it. And I love, I love the energy that he has in this book. He's he's an interesting guy. He's he's I don't know if he would frame himself like this, but he is clearly incredibly intelligent, right? Even though he talks about failures and all this kind of stuff. He's he's very bright and sharp. And then he comes to all of this with a, a mad person's amount of energy. He's he, he, yeah, when I've, inter I've interviewed him a number it. of times, and I've been on his podcast and that as well. And I think I, I think he featured me in his in his first book. I think you might have been in his first book as well, Victor. Um, uh, Sales success secrets. Something, it was something like that. And no, no. I speak to him, and I'm getting riled up. It's the same thing as happens to you at the beginning yeah, of the, that's, when that's we record. Like I'm getting riled up as I'm listening to him, and it's the same with you, Victor. I'll I'll start the conversation with you, and I'm like, "Oh, today's going pretty good." And halfway through, I, I feel like I'm speaking faster and faster and louder and louder as we go through the episode. I get the same, like I said, the same uh, effect of of yourself. But he's just got such a good energy that it, it drives you forward. So I can only imagine that is part of his success as well as a leader of a you know a venture backed, fast paced uh, startup in Seamless.ai. Well, there, there was you know. Oh, by the way, this morning. Uh, have you ever heard this uh, this app called Clubhouse? Do you know what I was? I've, so Jared Grant, <laughs> I interviewed him uh, last yeah. week, and he was saying that Grant Cardone is having a lot of success on there. I interviewed um, oh, who was it? I interviewed someone yesterday, and we were discussing it on there. And you just mentioned it now. I, I, I I've not Googled it yet. It's isn't it just like a live room that you can jump in and chat with people? Is that the premise? Yeah, it's it, it's it's a live room. Uh, so it's called Clubhouse, only available on iPhone right now. So and you got to be invited. 
Uh, if you need the invite, let me know. I'll hook you up. Yeah. And so what it is, it's just rooms you can set up or jump into and listen to people talk about whatever conversation. Now, they're not recorded. So once they're gone, they're gone. Uh, and so I was finding, I was going through some of these. I'll go, oh, somewhere interesting, somewhere a little too self-aggrandizing, if you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, and I, I jumped in on the one that were, where Grant was on there. Somebody said Grant was on there for like 15 hours on one of those as part of the, you know, sharing and promoting the show, obviously. And Jared was on there with them. Uh, big shout out to Jared Glenn and Grant Cardone down there in Florida. And so, but finally my friend convinced me. So this morning I said, well, let me start a room because now you can open up your room. It, it, you got to jump in and do it, right? And so the first person to pop up into my room was Brandon this morning. It wasn't Vlad. He's walking his dog. And so you could just have, and we wound up having a nice conversation. Other people joined the room. Uh, but one of the things I love about the book, and that is, if, you know, if you want, you want to understand highs and lows, this is the book for you. But what was also interesting was that you also get some insight into his upbringing. And how his upbringing plays into this, this, I don't know, this, 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 this madman called Brandon. And I say that in a positive way, right? And so the madman, because it's like his, his energy is just incredible, man. The guy comes at you. And so anyway, I highly recommend the book. Uh, to me, it was great from a sales standpoint. The book before, the book he wrote before this was Sales Secrets. And I think the one before that was Social Selling Something. So I think this is his fourth book, actually. So he's cranking out books, but this is it's an interesting story. I like it that it has more backstory about him. Check out the book, Whatever It Takes, Brendan Bornanson. It's a fair point, that, Victor. I feel like, and we won't do it now, I'm conscious of time on, on this episode, but we should have a dive into Victor Antonio's, uh, Victor Antonio's background. Because you, you've hinted at a couple of things just uh, you know from the, the back streets of Chicago, I think, with the words that you said earlier on. Uh, I think that'd be interesting for the audience, and myself as well. We'll do that at some point, right? Yeah, I mean, okay, I don't really, I mean, by the way, they can go online, you can watch a whole documentary of me. It's, and I think I've mentioned it before, right? It's called The Motivator, yep. The Business of Self. Yep. And so it's, it's online, but yeah, one day we can do a deep dive into the, uh, I got stories. I got a lot of stories. <laughs> we should, got- in fact, if, if you're up for this, mate, I would love to come on your podcast and interview you and give your audience uh, you know, a background to Victor Antonio in case they're new listeners or they haven't seen the documentary. And then you can come on uh, the Selden podcast and interview me and kind of uh, uncover perhaps some things that the audience, they've listened to myself for years as well, perhaps haven't uh, clocked onto, if you'd be cool with that. Do you know what just hit me? Do you know what just hit me? That I'm somewhat ashamed now. I said, why haven't I had Will on my podcast? Come I've been on, waiting. I, I had to I'm start like, a brand just, new show. I had to start a brand new show to get you to engage with me, Victor. That's how. How many times you've been on the Salesman podcast? Maybe three, four, maybe even five times. No, 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 not that <sighs> many. I think seven times, times, about thirteen times. Well, it's getting embarrassing now. By the way, it is. It, well, in defense of Victor Antonio, in defense of Victor Antonio, is that I was still trying to work out the mechanics of doing interviews because I, you know, I just start doing interviews. But man, I, you're going to be on the show. I'm going to do. I'm going to interview you, and then. <laughs> We can do another one. You interview me, man. All right, but anyway, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Well, okay. So next one, I've, I feel like this could be a topic and its own on its own right. So the title of this post from DigitalCommerce360.com is the new self surface era, where B two B selling is headed in twenty twenty one. So I'm gonna just throw out some quotes from the the post here, and then we can comment on them. But again, quoting, consumers have always wanted more control over the sales process. And in the B2B world, it's no different. The pandemic has disrupted the way that we work and conduct in business. B2B buyers have come to crave the, quote, Amazon-like experience that they're accustomed to in their personal lives. Victor, do you believe that this is true? That B2B buyers want to buy via an Amazon web portal and don't want to speak to salespeople and don't want to have potentially value added by an expert in their space chatting with them do you and do does the marketplace just want a one click button for software for commercial real estate purchases whatever it is in the b2b space do people just want an amazon experience you know by the way we all yearn at any level for the amazon experience but after talking to my friend with his company enersys i mean you really have to go into a a plant and do a walkthrough to yeah. suggest any type of power distribution model. So you just can't go to Amazon and get that. So in the compact sale, no. But I think in, in B2B, semi-commoditized products, I say yes. 
Okay, so I'll continue and then I'll, I'll throw it back to you. So again, quoting, in 2021 and beyond, self-service will become much more mainstream as organizations are forced to make the leap to digital selling to survive the impact of COVID-19. So again, Victor, has the, well, I guess this is case in point here with the organization that you're talking about. If we can't go and do a digital on-site tour and that is perhaps replaced by some kind of virtual tour where maybe it's not a salesperson that's tagging along. Maybe you just, you use some kind of uh, AR system that scans the room and pulls all of the, uh, the, the how do you describe it? The schematics of the building that we'd be uh, putting our software, hardware, whatever it is into. Uh, that replaces the salesperson, the engineer going out there. Mm. Does that accelerate the, the this perhaps shift to an Amazon one-click buying situation? I think so. I'm going to say yes. Short answer, yes. And there's one final bit here. I won't go through the whole of it. Uh, at some point, it's got to be boring listening to me read from a blog post, right? Um, but I'll, I'll read a tiny little bit more. The B2B experience gets optimized when organizations are able to decrease the amount of time between a buyer's intent and actions by making information around product details and purchasing methods clear on the e-commerce platform. So this is something that I think we talked about on the show in the past. Mm -hmm. The last medical device yep. company that I worked for would not allow me to hand over a product catalog that had no pricing in to a, a doctor, a surgeon. They wouldn't let me leave them with a theatre manager who wants to. They practically want to pick up the phone, just quote a, a number of a product and make a call. They Instead, the organisation, they probably changed now, instead the organisation wanted them to call me and then me to essentially place the order on behalf of the customer because they were so scared about these product catalogs getting in the hands of the competitors. Now, this is ludicrous because I went from the biggest medical device company in endoscopy, en endoscopy to the other biggest medical device company in endoscopy. Endoscopy, I always get that word wrong. And I pulled all my, I just kept all the catalogs from one brand and to the other. So everyone knows the pricing. Everyone knows the products. It was a complete mess. And there was no online catalogs. There's no online pricing. I'm sure there is now. So is this something that needs to change, Victor? Does, does let me ask you this. Does the customer have a right to know what the price of a product or service is before they have to engage with a salesperson? Yes. I'm, I'm moving towards full disclosure transparency. Uh, I read a book. I think I mentioned it with two pod, three podcasts ago. The one by Marcus Sheridan. They ask, you answer, yep. right? Which is a full. I, I love his philosophy about full transparency. I go to a website. I get really mad when I can't find pricing. Mm -hmm. And this whole request a demo. Okay. I'll request a demo, but can you at least give me a sample of the demo? It's almost like, I don't want to show you anything until you give me your email and set up a time. Why can't you just give me a sufficient demo? Sometimes they'll only give me a one minute cheesy demo. So transparency, transparency, effortless experience, transparency. Is there an opportunity here, Victor, right. for a startup to go buy all these products mm -hmm. or services and then release essentially training videos on the product or service so that you can view all of this, not from the vendor, but from a third party. And then you can make your purchasing decisions from that. Now, I don't know about user licenses and I'm sure there's uh, there's legalese in there to stop you doing some of this maybe. But is that a potential uh, startup for someone there to go through all these companies that you can only uh, request a demo, there's no videos of the product, they make all these hypes and these claims to go purchase it, legitimately purchase it, and then create content and perhaps do affiliate sales or get a commission on everyone that you sell from your own training content. I mean, it's I'm shocked that somebody hasn't come up with Zoom University or something like that, right? It's, it's, it's being used. Why not create a whole university just around that from your perspective, not the vendor perspective? So the answer is yes. The opportunity is there for somebody to kind of buy these products, use them, and put out real reviews. Yeah. Let's kind of put that, let's highlight that, real reviews. <laughs> And that's difficult, right? Because then if you're taking commissions and one brand is going to give you way more commissions than the other, how real is the review going to be? I'm sure there are, I'm sure there are ways around this and to do it uh, legitimately, but I guess that's the issue there. Well, let's wrap up this episode, Victor, with some maybe good news from 2020 from Salesforce, right? All right. Salesforce posted this. Salesforce. 2020 wasn't all bad. Really? Here are six incredibly positive, powerful takeaways. One. When forced, business proved they could pivot, there it is again, faster than they thought possible, and not just in accommodating remote work. Two, 
digital transformation of warp speed. Nice. The race for COVID vaccine led to a novel way to develop vaccines in general. Yes, it did. Uh, four, lack of travel leads to a huge drop in greenhouse gases. I forgot what country it was where they haven't been able to see a mountain. I think it's in India. Yep. And then now they can see it wherever it was. It's amazing. Number five, shift to remote work offers an opportunity for workplace inclusion and diversity. Number six, this was my favorite. Higher education finally po- poised for a makeover. Yes, I'm tired of these universities basically ch- overcharging us for buildings and monuments we don't need or use and still charging 300 bucks for a textbook when they could just give it to me on a Kindle. Come on. <laughs> what do you say, Well, Do you feel then, Victor, because I, I strongly... Um... I strongly believe that this is true, and there's plenty of evidence that to back up my beliefs on this, that higher education, universities in the UK, colleges in the US are ripe to just be massively disrupted over the next five to ten years. Absolutely. Well, you know, you know, you look at uh, companies that always called Udemy. Yep. Udemy, Udemy, I don't know how you say it. But I mean, I think they kind of threw the first rock at the window and kind of gave it a little crack. You know, basically shattering the illusion that you have to do it this one way. Uh, uh, like University of Phoenix is a big company here that basically, again, all these online training universities, colleges, informal education. I think that's the new, you know, we're moving in that direction because a lot of people are just, aren't built for colleges. And I don't know about you, Will, but if you're investing $100,000, $150,000 in college, come on. That's a little much, you know, for what you can get online. That's all I'm saying. So I'll, I'll frame it like this. And I think this is a perfectly succinct way to frame it up, right? UK has just gone into lockdown. Universities are still charging the students and it's all remote learning. Now, if I'm paying, university in the UK is nowhere near the cost in the US. In the UK, it's capped at, I think it's like three grand a term. So maybe you come out of, I think I had like, I had like 15 grand student debt. Um, so it's a, oh no, now it's gone up to seven and a half grand per term. So maybe you come out with 30,000 pound student debt, uh, but, it, but it is capped, right? Whether you go to Leeds, Oxford, uh, Manchester, it doesn't matter, the, the prices are capped. So with all that said, we've gone into lockdown. Students have been forced to learn from home essentially. A lot of student accommodation has closed. So students are back home with the parents or, you know, if they're not fortunate to have them around, they're having to live with a friend or, or you know, rent somewhere in the meantime. Why would they pay? Especially if you go to a shit university. Why would you pay that amount of money when Harvard have a lot of their courses online for free? These big prestigious uh, US universities, a lot of the UK ones haven't shifted to this yet. But Stanford, I have an incredible uh, entrepreneurship course that I'm about a third of the way through um, that I've been working on over Christmas as well. The, the, why would you pay for training from, you know, it's different when you're in person because you can put your hand up, you can ask questions. There's expertise in the room that will be able to help you. But if everything's going to shift to this remote model, why would you pay for it and not just get free content? It's, it, this blows my yeah. mind. I feel like that's the biggest disruptor in this space. Well, you know, it, everybody thought that you needed a degree to get a job. And I think companies now look at that and go, "Ah, I'm not sure if that's, you know, that was the requirement, you know, the ticket to get into the stadium, to the arena. Well, now even companies are saying, well, not necessarily because today's generation, they learn online. You know, they figure some of this stuff out and some of the best employees don't have degrees. I'm not saying the degree is not important because it depends on the degree, but less and less, I think universities are going to have a hold on that piece of business. And I think universities here in the U.S., on average, you're paying about a hundred thousand dollars total. I mean, and then and if you were you if and again, sometimes there is no support. The average student debt here in the U.S. is about fifty-two thousand dollars when they graduate. I mean, think about that. And some, by the way, if it's like medical fields, you're looking at three, four hundred thousand dollars in debt by the time they come out, and it makes no sense, if, especially if you're not using all the resources. I bet you a lot of these universities didn't give a refund back every, when they send mm-hmm. people home. Mm-hmm. Of course. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, uh, they're, they're held to and, a different standard than a, a commercial training product, and they shouldn't be. Yeah, that is correct. I'm with you, Will. And I will say yes. this, Victor. I will say this. Uh, regular listeners will know my partner's a, a medical doctor, right? She's a geriatrician. I don't want geriatricians. I don't want doctors to do online training. I want doctors to go into a university setting and there's a base level of of understanding, of training. I think uh, doctors, engineers, maybe the law, um, there's a few specific industries where university is the right place to learn your craft. But if you're a programmer, probably not. You just need to create. 
know what I mean? It's in, it's it's it, it, it genuinely blows my mind that university is is still a thing. And Google, Facebook, Apple have all removed the requirements of a degree in the entry level uh, roles. So that opens the doors I, for I didn't know to that. do the same. I did know that. Yep. I did not know that. I think that's a good point. And by the way, you had a note here on greenhouse gases. I think that's big. So I wanted to ask this you personally. Of, yeah, uh, I, I, sorry to interrupt you. There. I wanted to ask you personally with this uh, the point from the Salesforce article of uh, lack of travel leads to huge drop in greenhouse gases. Are you a eco friendly man? Is this something that you think about with your purchases, uh, whether it be cars, whether it be utilities, whatever it is? Are you uh, are you conscious and, and thoughtful about the environment? And I'll say I'm not at all. So um, I, I, I'm not I, trying I, to set I, you up. I, I, no, no, no. I I think more no than yes. Yeah. Here's how I'm qualifying it. Uh, one is we don't drive a lot, a lot. That's one of the, so we cut, we're kind of, and, and we know that our next car now, remember I've had my car for almost 20 years now, no 21 now going this year. So, you know, when it comes to just using what you got, that's me, I'm frugal. Right. So I think that, uh, next car is going to be electric. So we're with that. I hate, I, we bring our own bags to the actual grocery store. So I'm a little conscious of that. So there thumbs up on that. My biggest concern is when I, and I, you know, bottles don't really dig them a lot. So we got filtered water. So yeah, I guess I am better than, yeah, I'm moving towards yes now. Uh, the, the thing that concerns me, and this is going to tie back it accidentally to what I've mentioned already is that nobody's thinking about the ele electronics we're producing and the batteries. Nobody's thinking about that. If, if anybody who understands how a battery, any battery is made, realizes that the different manufacturing processes go through the chemicals that's used to create this and their shelf life, their half life. I mean, this stuff doesn't just biodegrade. You, where, I mean, where does it all go? Where does your iPhone go when you no longer want it? Your computer, where does it go? These are the questions I'm asking. So that from an environmental standpoint, if I had to take up one cause, I would call it the battery cause. What are we doing with these batteries? How often do you replace your, I assume you use an iPhone. That, there's, a, there's a broad yeah. assumption. How often do you replace yeah. your iPhone, Victor? Maybe three years. I stretch it. I stretch it. I, you know, the thing is, it's only when the battery starts giving out that you yeah. have to kind of change it. Other than that, I wouldn't. I don't, you know, a little pixel enhancement here and there on my camera is not going to get me to buy a new phone. So I try not to, you know, I, I, I use what I got. I'm old school, man. I use what I got until <laughs> I can't use it anymore. And I said, all right, now I'll go get it. I, I'm so. the same. Look, I, I'll buy stuff for the studio, and obviously it goes through the business. But I enjoy playing with it all. Um, but my iPhone, I think if it's, an, if it's an iPhone Seven. It's probably like four or five years old now because I drop it all the time. It breaks. But uh, the reason I ask that is a lot of the issue and the environmental burden of batteries is uh, it's twofold. One, people wanting latest and greatest, which is fine. It's your, your money. You're spending it in the market. Great. Uh, no qualms with that. Um, so people buying new phones every year and then the phones that they are selling off just get dumped and, and used and uh, are never kind of repurposed. And then the other element of that is brands like Apple trying to reduce the right to repair items. If iPhones had a user mm -hmm. re replaceable battery, there'd be far less e-waste because people would replace the battery or I agree. They'd be, the battery would be replaced and then they'd be sent to um, perhaps less fortunate parts of the world where the cost of a new iPhone is is un, unreasonable for them to spend, but they might be able to spend dollars to get a, a you know a refurbished one. So this is both on both individuals and it's on large brands as well. Tesla, for example, they're having real issues and they're fighting in the courts over what they perceive is their right to stop people repairing Teslas. And they're putting all kinds of software locks on the, the hardware elements so things can't be changed out unless Tesla do it. Clearly, there's commercial reasons for that to, for, for their own success. But this adds to it. It's becoming more and more difficult to have, uh, if you've got a modern car, to replace things without sending it back to the OEM and the original manufacturer. And uh, batteries, as you said, are a massive part of this with consumer devices. So yeah, it's both, it's both on us, but it's also on the manufacturers of these devices as well to make it easy. You know, on, on the positive side, because we need to end on a positive side, is that because we're using a subscription as a service, we're not downloading, C we're not getting CDs and boxes and packages. I just realized the other day that we really don't even use our printer anymore. You know, we got DocuSign and stuff like that. So there's a lot of things we're doing moving in the right direction. And I, this digital push, this virtual push has made us become more conscious. And this whole greenhouse gas thing, university thing, these differences we're seeing now are now accented, they're highlighted, and maybe we'll pay more attention to them. Good stuff. Well, are you keen to, are you cool to wrap up there, Victor? Or is there anything else you want to add before we wrap up this episode? 
I thought that was a good cultural note at the end of this yeah. week in sales. So I don't have anything to add. Uh, wishing everybody a happy new year and hopefully we'll sell more. Happy new year, everyone who's listening. Uh, that was this week in sales and we'll speak with you again next week.